Well, welcome again to our study of the Psalms. Uh, we ended last week with uh, the opportunity to look at the most uh, memorable and beloved psalm of all. And I wanted to start again today uh, with that psalm because it's worth repeating. Uh, David uh, made sure that we understood not only his experience as a shepherd, but his relationship to God as a shepherd. And so when we come to this psalm, he begins with those beautiful words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that just about sums it up. It's sort of like the little boy who tried and tried and tried to learn the first verse of the psalm. And he finally got up to, to repeat his memory verse and he said, the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I want. So you can understand David's uh, resourcefulness and David's experience as he uh, gives us this psalm. He makes sure that we understand what he's experiencing. He tells us that he is uh, resting because the Lord makes him to lie down in green pastures and leads him beside still waters. David understood how important that was to a shepherd to bring his sheep to the place where they could rest and he could rest for a little bit as they uh, refresh themselves. And then the next verse says that David experienced God's restoration because he was leading him in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If you, could, if you can't recognize it already, I'm talking about rest, about righteousness, and I'm going to continue to follow through with the R's so that uh, we're having alliteration as part of our teaching today. David said he understood righteousness because God did it for his name's sake. And then uh, David says he restores my soul, that's part of his righteousness as well. You, he grows in his knowledge of God. You experience that when you talk about David going to the temple and he talks about his growth as he moves up and as he experiences God's intimacy with him. Uh, so David says he restores my soul and then he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Those two R's together. And then David says he has a refuge. There is no fear in David's life. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David understood what it was like to have God encircle him and protect him. When so many were against him, including Saul and his own son Absalom, David was aware that God protected and God took care of him. And then he talks about the rejoicing that comes in his life with the blessings of God. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, my cup runneth over. These were symbols of the kingly life that David experienced, of the excessive joy uh, that he experienced. And then finally, the resurrection. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David knew the resurrection. How he understood that, not in the same way that you and I do now, but he had it in his soul. And so we bless the Lord for David's recognition of the resurrection of Christ. We move on to Psalm 24 then, and you remember that this psalm and the words of Isaiah are very much alike. The earth's Earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. David reminds us, as did Isaiah, when he talked about uh, the Lord's graciousness uh, in his life. 
And he says, the world and all its people belong to him. Nobody escapes the love of God except those of us who refuse the love of God. Hell is never a place that human beings were intended to go. Only the devil and his angels had that place prepared for them. But those who trample over the goodness of God and the mercy and love of Jesus can go to hell along with Satan and his cohorts. So David is saying here, look, everything belongs to God and I will exalt him for what he's done. He laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. He changes uh, metaphors now and he says, I'm not going to talk about the ocean or the sea. I'm going to talk about the mountains, uh, how those who come to God for worship rise up as they march to Jerusalem. He says, who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those with hands and hearts, those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. And you remember here you're reflecting again, reviewing Psalm 1, David talking about the difference between the godly and the ungodly. And then he gives this wonderful invitation. And if you've ever sung in a choir, you've sung an anthem that had some words like this in it. Open up ancient doors, gates. Open up ancient doors and let the king of glory come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors and let the king of glory enter. Who is this king of glory? the Lord of heaven's armies. He's the king of glory. So David had this picture in his mind of God coming into the city that was his and sitting on the throne that had been given to David and to his ancestors. And it's a reference, a projection of the time when Christ will come back to earth, will sit on the throne of David and will rule and reign for a thousand years. Moving along with these Psalms now, Psalm 25 is really an expression of surrender in David's heart and life. He says, I give my life, I trust in you, I will not be disgraced or distracted. I'm, I'm reading from a, a translation of the Psalms that are uh, in the New Living uh, Bible. And I love some of these words that, that are your expression and mine, too, of surrender in our lives to God. Oh, Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced but disgrace comes only to those who try to deceive others. And this, again, this call for the path of life that David gave us in the 16th Psalm, show me the right path, O Lord, point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me that you are the God who saves me. All day long, I will put my hope in you. David wants us to be aware of allowing God to become the possessor of our lives. He teaches us here that life is a learning experience. The shepherd is restoring the sheep so that they can continue to prosper in the care of the shepherd. And Psalm 26 continues on this this track of David surrendering his heart and life to God. It's a psalm of David, we're sure. He affirms his life of integrity and honesty. And this time, David is a lot like Paul later on. 
he's ready to talk about the things he should talk about. He wants to, in some ways, brag about. And he says, I'm not going to do it uh, so that you can look at me, but I'm going to give you this testimony of what God has done and what's happened in my life. And he sums it all up by saying his confidence is in the mercy of the Lord. Do you and I have anything that we should brag about? No, not according to the Apostle Paul. God forbid that I should glory save in anything but the cross of Christ. David said, my confidence is in the Lord. He keeps me on the right track. He protects me. He enriches my soul as I walk with him on a daily basis. And now we continue with David's really famous question, of whom shall I be afraid? The strength of the Lord sustains David. Psalm 27 then becomes uh, a, an experience for David to say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What a confidence for you and me to have as well. God keeps us from fear. You know, fear is one of the most disabling emotions that any of us ever experience, whether it's the fear of failure or the fear of loss or the fear of death or sometimes the fear of success. But no fear can override God's blessing and God's love, God's confidence in you, for you, and because of his love for you. What a great truth and a testimony for us to experience along with David as we come to the 27th Psalm. He sums it up by saying, fortress and sanctuary are refreshers for God's victory and spirit, and so teach me to live spiritually and to walk patiently for the Lord. That's the summation of Psalm 27. We're going to move now to Psalm 28. We have to move a little quickly with these psalms because if they're 150, we're going to have to, to move along to cover the entire book of Psalms. The 28th Psalm is a penitent cry for God's mercy as David hears the thundering of God's righteousness around him. And he calls for a righteous standard to his enemies and to those that are ungodly. Give them what they deserve, he says in verse 9. Lead them like a shepherd. Carry them in your arms. I, hope, I don't know if you know anything about sheep. I've never, never been a sheep farmer. But one of the things I learned when I went to the Holy Land is watching uh, a shepherd with his sheep. I was sitting in a bus in Bethlehem and watched as three shepherds walked along the street and they talked. And when they talked, one of them moved to the left. The sheep that were his moved to the left with him. The sheep that were the, uh, sh the fold of the flock of the shepherd that was in the middle moved straight ahead. And then the sheep that were with the shepherd on the right turned and went that way. When they got to a place where there was kind of a grassy area, some of the sheep laid down. And one of the problems for sheep is when they lay down and turn over on their backs, they can't get up. So the shepherd has to go over, massage their legs, turn them over, make sure that they're standing upright. And he does this for several sheep uh, who need his attention. So. David says, I want you to know God leads us like a shepherd and he carries us in his arms. And often you'll see pictures of shepherds in the ancient world and they'll have one or maybe two sheep that they're carrying while the rest of the flock follows along with them. It's David's assurance that 
His, God's sheep will never be cast down, that is, turned upside down on their backs, but God will turn them over, lift them up, and carry them as well. Psalm, 90, Psalm 29, I should say, uh, changes tone just a little bit. The mighty voice of God is praised with similes of honor and power. And I just want to read some of these verses. Uh, I can't take time to read all of them. But uh, I'm, I've been impressed with the, the, the way David describes God's mighty power here. He says, Honor the Lord, you heavenly beings. Honor the Lord for his glory and strength. Honor the Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. I've said it a number of times, but if you've ever sung in a choir, use some of these, some of these words because... David became not only the hymn writer for Israel, but his thoughts carry over in our hymns and in our anthems as well. The voice of the Lord echoes above the sea. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty sea. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. And the voice of the Lord splits the mighty Caesars the Lord shatters the Caesars of Lebanon, cedars of Lebanon. These were the most uh, consistent building materials that were available uh, to the people of Israel. And David says, when the Lord speaks, it shatters even the strongest building and framing materials that we know. Then we move to Psalm 30, and here... David is rejoicing in the hope of rising from Sheol. It's the expression that David uses through the Psalms. And he's experiencing the promise of security and satisfaction in eternal life. David turns from mourning into joy in the 11th and 12th verses of the 30th Psalm. He says, for thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off, thy, put off my sackcloth and, in, and girded me with gladness. And to the end that my glory may sing praises to thee and not be silent, O Lord, my God. I will give thanks unto thee forever. God turns our mourning into gladness. I was at a birthday party not long ago and watched a little girl as she tried to dance with her daddy and she was too short. And so finally she just put both of her feet up on top of his shoes and held his hands and she danced with daddy. She turned the sadness, she couldn't do it, into the morning that went away and now she had gladness to know that daddy was holding her so everything was working out fine. I think David kind of had something like that in mind when he said, God is protecting you, God is loving you, and he's turning your mourning into joy. Now, we've had several reflections already in the Psalms about the resurrection of Christ, and here's another one. David understood somehow uh, because God had assured him that the Messiah was going to come and bring eternal life to the people of Israel. So he says, you've turned my mourning into joy. What a great experience for David to have. And finally, Psalm 31 for today, a Psalm of the Messiah. You can't read this Psalm without hearing the voice of Jesus from the cross. Let me just turn back uh, to the 31st Psalm for a moment. And the translation that's a little different than the King James says, O oh Lord, I've come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me, for you do what is right. Turn your ear to me. Listen to me. Rescue me quickly. This is the plea for protection in the time of struggle uh, in the life of Christ. And here the Messiah says in verse 5, something you recognize from the cross, 
I entrust my spirit into your hand. Rescue me, Lord, for you are a faithful God. So Jesus is saying, I commend my spirit to you. Nothing happens. Finally, he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And David reassures us that the Messiah is going to be taken care of even in this disgrace and distress that represents the cross. So when Jesus dies and comes back from the grave, David is seeing that the Messiah is trusting in God. Here it says in verse 14, But I am trusting you, O Lord, saying, You are my God. My future is in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. Let your favor shine on your servant. In your unfailing love, rescue me. You and I know that God didn't physically rescue Jesus from the cross, but he brought him back from the grave, and he's the only one that comes out of the grave by his own power and becomes the Lord of the universe, the firstborn of those begotten from the dead. Well, we're going to look further uh, at the book of Psalms the next time we get together. God bless you and have a wonderful time. Oh,